Dobrý deň, sledujete reláciu Portrét na teatri. Dnes pozvanie prijal král talk show, ktorého milióny divákov po celom svete sledovali na stanici CNN neuveriteľných 25 rokov. Jeho hostiami boli prezidenti, umelci, herci, ľudia, ktorí tvorili históriu. Spravil 50 tisíc rozhovorov, napísal 16 kníh, je držiteľom televíznych ocenení Emmys a 5 Peabody Awards. Do siene slávy najlepších novinárov sveta vstúpil už 5 krát. Od júna je držiteľom Guinnessovho rekordu za najdlhšie vysielanú televíznu talk show na svete. Vážení diváci, hosťom Relácie Portrait je Larry King. Welcome. Vítajte. Great to be here. Larry, I, I miss your red, uh, red uh, suspenders. I, I have every color in the world. I thought that you're coming, coming to the post-communist country. You're going to wear red ones. <laughs> yeah, I should have thought of that. I should have worn red. Do they reflect your mood or how do you pick the one in the morning? The basic thing is not the suspender but the tie. I'm not wearing a tie now because I'm so relaxed with you, Andrea. Why would I wear a tie? <laughs> Why would I be formal with you, Andrea? Thank you. Uh, no, uh, I picked the tie first, mm -hmm. and oh, I must have 300 ties, and probably 100 braces, 125. I have some in New York, some in Washington. And then after I like the tie and the shirt, then I pick the brace that goes with the tie. I guess you know the story that, for example, Madeleine Albright, she was choosing the pin and it reflected how she faced the issue she was talking about on the political scene. Yes, pins, it's yeah. a beautiful book. So those ties are that symbolic as well? No, I, 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 like, I like the look. This is, a, to me, a nice look. It's uh, clean. It, uh, the camera likes it. It works well off shirts, with or without a tie. You can wear it with jeans, or you could wear tuxedos. It's just very nice. Just I used to wear huge glasses. Yes. I, you know, when I look at pictures of myself, then I look ridiculous. You look ridiculous. Uh, yeah, That's I how look you like see yourself. I look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. I look, I look weird, man. Uh, well, I, was, I, I had more weight then. You know, I used to weigh, before I had my heart attack, I think I weighed about 190, 195 pounds. I was very overweight. And so I thought wearing big glasses would take away from the fact that I had fat cheeks and everything. But I look stupid. I look ridiculous. I'm not sure if people recognize that you watching your show for 25 years exactly puts you in the situation that you see yourself not only growing older, <laughs> but losing your hair and all these small details. Andrea, you're so romantic. You, the way you build up a man Makes, makes you feel so good. On <laughs> <laughs> so how no, do you face what First of what all, you see? I never watch myself a lot. Why? I'd see people, because I know what I did. Uh, in other words, once the show was over, it was over. It was live 95% of the time. I couldn't do anything about it, right? Once the show ends, you're on, it's over. I know what I did. So early on, I used to watch it to see mannerisms and stuff, but this was in Miami, you know. This, I did CNN for 25 years, but I've been on television because I have friends that I grew up with, close friends, and we've been friends since seventh grade. So when I see them, they look 18 to me because we grew at the same time. So I don't look in the mirror and see old. I see maybe more lived in, but I, was, I don't see old. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still Larry. I'm still Larry from the neighborhood. In one of your last interviews, when you were leaving the Larry King show on CNN, you said, and now I would like to quote, that's why I'm looking at the papers, I want to expand, I want to do other things that I haven't been able to do. So please, give us an update on your life. What are you doing, actually? Sure, good question, Andrea. Update on my life. First, I hope we have the announcement pretty soon. We're very close to a very big announcement. I can't say anymore. But this could be a big story. And at my age, it would be like a, a new birth of a different career sideways. Like but a new identity? No, not a new identity, but a new, ma I don't want to, if I say any more, I'll give it away now. I don't want to jinx it either. And um, I'm making speeches, I make appearances. I've uh, emceed at dinners, and I'm also doing a comedy tour. I tell a lot of funny stories. And I've been around the United States. We're going to do a lot more to other cities, going to Australia. Uh, next year, we're going to go to London. Mm -hmm. I like making people laugh. I've always done it. I used to speak at conventions and sales meetings. But when my show ended, my nephew is a big Broadway producer, very successful. And he had seen me speak. 
So he said, why don't you take that comedy talent to a theater, to stages, go to on theater. We'll book you on a, a comedy tour. The hardest part is selling people that I do comedy because they're so used to Larry King Live, except when I had comics on. It was a very serious show. And I'm not that serious. A per In fact, I've never given a serious speech. Every time I get up to talk, I, I try to be funny. Do you find it more difficult to making fun instead of conducting interviews? No. No? Uh, it's still me. Actually, it's a bigger kick to me to make. Most of it is fun in myself. It's very self-deprecating. The, all the stories are bad or weird things that happen to me. And no, it's, you know what it all is? It's control. Um, you control this now, Andrea. You, you, because you, it's your interview, and you're asking the question, so you can go anywhere you want with it. So you're in total control, and that's what I had for so much of my life: control on television, control on radio. I did a five-hour national radio show for many years. I've interviewed over 50,000 people. When I stand on a stage, the circumstances are different. There's no guest. It's still a control. I mean, I know where I'm going. I'm trying to make people laugh. The audience is captive. They're in there. All I have to do is be good. And I've never been nervous uh, because I really know that it ain't the end of the world. I am not solving the world's great problems. I'm just trying to have a good time. <laughs> so there, re there really isn't a great difference, except there's not as sterile as television. Like this is very sterile here, a few people around, you and I sitting lights, obviously great chemical attraction, <laughs> but it's, it's very <laughs> sterile. But on the stage with 2,000 people, so that's, it's more fun. It's a lot of energy being in control on so many fronts in your life. But I like energy. When do you love to lose control? Oh, at home, none. <laughs> None. No, control like goes out. Like, what is happening then? Take out the garbage. Uh, and there's, <laughs> there's no control at home. And that's true of, of any man. Uh, that's why those of us in broadcasting like it so much, because we can get away with being away from life's vagaries. You know, life is so unpredictable. We don't know what's going to happen the next minute. You walk into a room, you can meet someone that changes your life. Uh, so you don't control that. You can't control another thing. You, you know, the one thing you can't control is who you will love. You can't control it. You can, you can do things about it, but you can't control the feeling. In other words, I can't make someone go into a room and fall in love today or fall out of love today. So that part of life is so unpredictable. And when it happens, it's so. <laughs> but I had a life where I controlled my environment. At the same time, was surprised all the time because I didn't know what the answers would be. So even though I'm in control, it's also still illuminating and happening at the same time. So I've been very fortunate to have a life 54 and a half years of doing this, of controlling and being surprised at the same time. I never thought of it in those terms, but it sure worked for me. When I was reading an interview in a New Yorker with you, they asked you about your biggest accomplishment. And I was pleased to see that your answer was my fatherhood. Mm -hmm. You didn't talk too much yourself about your fatherhood before. It's surprising. Well, there's nothing more important than children. And uh, three grown. And uh, two little boys, 12 and 11. And... Uh, that's the only love that's unrequited. In other words, you don't have to love your wife and you don't have to love your parents. You, you can dislike your parents, but your children? Someone said to me once, it's really true, that John Kennedy's mother was terribly sad when her son died. But Lee Harvey Oswald's mother, the mother of the man who killed him, was just as sad when he got killed. Because love is unrequited. You want your children to be successful. But no matter what they are or what they become, 
You love them. And when I have that feeling for my children, I mean, there's no... I yelled at my son the other day before I came here, and I feel guilty ever since. Even though he was wrong, I still feel guilty because the love is just... I don't, the most amazing thing to me, of interviewing all these years, interviewing parents who've lost a child. I don't know how they, I don't know how you go on. I have no idea. That is life's worst thing. Your parents are supposed to die before you. No child's supposed to die. That's why I'm agnostic or atheist or I don't believe in. No. No. You uh, don't pray. No, I, I, when I was a kid, I was bar mitzvah, I was Jewish, you know, I, I went to synagogue, but now I go on the holidays out of respect. I usually get up and speak on Yom Kippur. But uh, to believe in someone looking down, judging me or making rules or, no, nah, I don't agree. I, I respect people. My wife's very religious in, in the Mormon faith. I don't buy it at all. I buy it as superstition. Uh, in fact, when I was a kid, I began at about age 13. Maybe when my father died, that had a big effect on me. It was at age nine. So uh, nine remember. and a half, yeah. yeah. But I didn't like the God of the Old Testament. I didn't like, smite my enemies. Show me 20 good people, I'll save the town. Kill them. This is a loving God. I never thought he was a loving guy. Uh, whenever I, I've interviewed, except for any pope, I've interviewed every great religious leader, Greek Orthodox Church, Muslim leaders, uh, Jewish, Protestant, Catholic, Baptist. Billy Graham I counted as a friend, good friend. I never bought what they were saying because they never had an answer to the ultimate question of why. Why did you, since you're omnipotent, God is omnipotent, mm -hmm. how could you permit a Holocaust? How could you permit the death of a child? And they always had the same answer. We do not question the ways of the Lord. All right. If you speak the Lord's words and you claim to be the deliverer of those words, how can you say we don't question the ways of the Lord? How can you say it's Larry King? Well, uh, uh, one of my favorite <laughs> of people that I knew years ago was Lenny Bruce, and Lenny got chastised a lot. He was called like a sick comedian and everything. But Lenny was a genius. And Lenny used to say, any man claims to deliver the word of the Lord who speaks for the Lord, who got a calling from the Lord, who has two suits while someone has no clothes, is a cop-out. Now, I've asked that and never had a good answer to that either. <laughs> so I respect those who believe. I think they have a wonderful uh, crutch. I think they handle death better. I don't believe you're going anywhere. No. Nope. nope. So I live for this moment counts. So what is the meaning of all of this then? Don't know. Empty and meaningless? And no. we give you the meaning? It is. Uh, you could be depressed and say it's a, it's a boring interlude between the heavenly eternal sp sleep. Someone said that one. But uh, no, it's not meaningless. In fact, it's very meaningful. If this is all there is, I think it's meaningful. Now, my friend Edward Bennett Williams, the great lawyer, was a devout Catholic brightest man I ever knew and a devout Catholic and he had cancer and he was dying and we were walking, we were walking along uh, Connecticut Avenue in Washington once and I was telling him how I feel and he said how, how could you not believe? See to him he was brilliant how could you not believe? Because if this is all there is if this is all there is why don't we just eat strawberries or make love. What do you go out to work for? What, what is the point? You want to build a higher monument to yourself? There's got to be a purpose. I don't, I, didn't, I don't see it, but I respected him a great deal. So I respect the faith. I, I wish I had it in a way. I just can't make that leap. It's called leap of faith. Mm -hmm. I can't make the leap. 
I've seen you very emotional today. I was in the editing room while you were giving an interview and you said, I believe that I will see my sons going to a college. I would like to be here. Sure. Are you scared of death? You bet. <laughs> I'm scared of it because I don't, I don't think anything happens. And I'm so curious. I want to be around. Who's going to be the next president? Who's going to win the World Series? If my father saw me now, he would come on. He never made any great money in his life. He was, a, he was a, an immigrant from Australia, died of a heart attack. And I'm speaking in, in Slovakia. And I'm, 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 I'm being seen all over the world, you know. No, I, it's, um, yeah, I, I hope I'm around. That's what I said, I would like my, someone asked me, how would you like your obituary to read? And I would like it to read, world's oldest man ever passed away today. <laughs> let's fly to heaven and let's imagine that we are doing the Larry King live show with Mr. Zeiger, your father. What would Larry King ask him? Well, I would ask him, is, did, you, did you, well, first of all, I was only nine and a half. So it would be unfair, you know, to say the obvious, did you think I would be, I would become this? What did you, what did you wish for me? But I wouldn't ask any of that. I would ask how he handled the loss of a son. Uh, we had a brother who died before I was born. And that's why my father got very attached to me. He wanted a son. Uh, they used to tell me that in the hospital before my mother gave birth, he begged for a son, because he'd lost a son who was six years old. And uh, so I was very attached to him. He took me everywhere with him. And uh, when he left, when he died, I took it as leaving me. I was mad. I didn't go to the funeral. I think I took it as betrayal. So I would ask him, did he have any idea how I felt? What happened that day? I wasn't with him. That day he died. What was it like? What were you thinking? Why did you smoke? <laughs> why didn't you take better? Well, who knew that? Everybody smoked. I smoked. Why Why did you do that? Yeah, a lot of whys. I guess if you would sit here with your kids, how would they define you? Who is this man? Oh, they have a lot. They get a kick. Me. I think it's Who very, very hard to be the child of, a, of someone well-known. Uh, tour buses go by our house every 10 minutes. Psh, people waving and taking pictures. Even though I'm not on the air except four times a year doing specials, there's, they still come around. And the kids go out and they get a kick. But they're so used to it now, see? So I asked uh, my 12-year-old once, well, what's, you know, uh, he doesn't, he, there's parts of it he doesn't like. Like, uh, don't tell people I'm your son. You know, let me go play ball, but don't, don't go around. Please don't post, don't. It's like pressure to him. Mm -hmm. You know, he wants his own man. He likes the fruits of it. He likes the fact that he gets tickets to every ball game that he can have money to go to the movies, and he <laughs> has a good life. But he doesn't like that kind of pressure. I think the little one, the 11-year-old who wants to be a comedian, he's a show business type. He'll follow in the Like an extrovert? Oh, he likes to, to have an attention? He's all over the place. He's a beautiful little kid, but he's like round eyes, and he's like, the 12-year-old is very serious. The 12-year-old is the kind of kid who would if you said, how do you feel, he would say, well, what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> what, do I look bad? Is there something wrong? <laughs> well, so they're very, they're very different children. Uh, but I, 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 I think they enjoy the fruits of, the, of a famous father and dislike the side effects of those fruits. Do you coach them, mentor them? I try. I, li I live in an unreal world. You know, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's real, but it's unreal. I mean, fame is unreal. It's, 
it's fragile. And, uh, you know, you walk down the street and people want to take pictures of you. That's not normal for a kid. It's just not normal. So I'm trying to think in their head. I don't know how they, what they, how they think when, when your father is. He walks into a room and people know him. And because course, I put them on television. They were on my last show with me. My 12-year-old my took it very seriously. My 11-year-old did an imitation of his mother, imitation of me <laughs> talking to his mother, did my voice, you know. He, uh, one of the big differences is also they're a child of privilege. We were very poor. I mean, very poor. When my father died, we were on relief. They call it welfare now. It's called relief then for three years. New York City bought my first pair of glasses. Uh, they paid our rent for three years until my mother could go to work because I was nine, my brother was six. And she had to stay home. So uh, New York City took care of me. Now these kids, mm -hmm. like the first $20 bill I ever saw, I think I was 12 years old, and I delivered groceries for Willie's grocery store. I never saw a $20 bill. These kids, the other day my son is going to the mall and he said, uh, you have a hundred? A hundred? Yeah, give me a hundred. I'll bring you the change. They never bring the change. <laughs> so they're not spoiled in, in the sense that they're arrogant or huffy or anything. But, but. They can afford a different lifestyle. Yeah. That's definitely the way. I know that you love short questions and simple questions. Well, I, I, I question more than one, more than two sentences. It's usually too long. I left myself out of questions. I didn't use the word I. I'd use it in an interview with you because you're talking about me, but I left it out. I never learned anything when I was talking. So I wanted my guest to be the star of the show. I'm going to be back the next night. You know, it still said Larry King live. So I, w I wanted to draw them out the best I could. Can we play a small Q&A? You and I could play anything you like, Andrea. <laughs> if you okay. keep this up. <laughs> So, Just keep it up, Andre. Best keep talk it. show ever, Mr. King. That I liked? Yes. Mike Wallace, who later became a friend who interviewed me for 60 minutes. I loved his manner. We worked very differently. Mike could be brutal. I never liked being brutal, but he had a great, he had a great voice. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's ill now, and he's in his 90s. I got to visit him. Uh, but he was my favorite. I used to run home to watch him. The most frightening moment in a show? Uh, it was 9-11. Uh, broadcasting 9-11, not knowing, you know, that first night we didn't know what it was. Was it going to come again? Was it going to hit Los Angeles? I was in Los Angeles. And working 60 straight nights, going to the scene. It worked. It, I would call, I would, frightened, fearful, fearful of the unknown. How'd they pull this off? How'd they pull that off? It was unbelievable, you know? And that it happened to us, nothing's supposed to happen to America. So I put, I think you'd have to be insane not to be fearful of what was next. Yeah, that would be number one fear. That was frightened. The most influential show you ever did. Probably uh, uh, the Ross Perot Al Gore debate over NAFTA. Uh, NAFTA was the North American uh, tree, uh, free trade, and uh, it was going to lose in the Senate. And it was the only in history, the only time a sitting vice president debated an ordinary citizen on international television at the vice president's request because it was going to lose. And uh, Gore really did well that night, and Perot did not. And uh, it was an hour and a half debate. It was the highest rated show in cable history. And uh, Perot and the NAFTA vote won. And uh, Bill Clinton called me the next day and he said, I owe you big time. My personal was when I had uh, Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel, Yasser Arafat, the head of the Palestinian Authority, and King Hussein of Jordan, all on the same time. 
that was his start. It won't ever happen again. And I was doing diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all by satellite. Hussein was in Jordan. Rabin was in, Rabin was in, uh, in uh, Tel Aviv. I think he was in Tel Aviv. And, uh, and Arafat was in the West Bank. Uh, that was, but it didn't have the ratings that the pro or debate did. A lot of things that uh, we think uh, you know, America tends to be isolated. So the things that we as journalists think is major news. The Middle East is not a big story in the American Midwest. I would say unfortunately. Unfortunately. Okay. The most capable president that ever sat in your show, your favorite one. I liked them all for different reasons and respected them for different reasons. It's not easy to be president. It's not easy to get to be president. And why someone wants to be president is a little insane to begin, a little nuts to want to be president, enormous ego to want to be president. I'm going to lead you, but the favor would be Clinton. Uh, one, because uh, he was so bright and such a great politician and one of the great interview subjects of all time. Because Bill Clinton made eye contact, he answered your question, he focused well, he had incredible delivery, dynamic looking, and he was a very good president. Uh, so you combine all those things, uh, Clinton. And we share a friendship. We share the same heart surgery. <laughs> uh, well, we shared uh, an interest in the opposite sex. <laughs> I, I like Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> the show where they made you cry. I didn't cry much on uh, in turn of there were a few moments where I cried, but probably the one with the uh, the New York City policeman who uh, his name was McDonald and uh, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, they said you're going to interview a New York City cop who is uh, paraplegic and he's uh, paralyzed from the neck down. And uh, his father was a cop, and his grandfather was a cop, and he was still a cop. He was in uniform, and the police paid him to be a spokesman for police. And he came in. I didn't know much else about the story. He had a beautiful wife with him and a little four- or five-year-old boy. And so the obvious was, what happened to you? And he said, uh, there, were, there, were a, there were a bunch of, there were bike robberies in Central Park. Some a kid was robbing bikes. Some kids were robbing bikes. Well, bikes were being stolen. And he was in his squad car with a partner driving through Central Park. And they saw this black kid with a brand new Schwinn bike, expensive bike. And he got out of the car to question the kid, and the kid shot him. Right in the chest, he saw a puff of smoke. He didn't feel any pain. Down he went. They took him to the hospital, the Catholic Church, priest came, gave him the last rites, and he managed to survive, but be paralyzed, neck down, the rest of his life. And after he recovered and he was home, and he stayed on the police force and agreed to be a spokesman for the police, he wanted to talk to the kid. It was 17. 17. So they took him to the jail. The kid, I think, was sentenced five years, attempted murder. And he said, why'd you shoot me? And the kid said, I was an A student. My brother was a bad guy, my brother. And he was wanted, and he was going to run away to Philadelphia or something. He gave me this gun to hold to hold for him. So I had the gun with me. And I never bothered anyone. I never, my a good son, good student. And I worked for six years as a delivery boy because I always wanted a Schwinn bike. And I saved up the money and I bought the Schwinn bike. And I'm in the park with my bike. And you were the 30th cop to stop me.
30 times stop me. And I want to ask you a question. And he asked the cop, if I were white, would you have stopped me? And McDonald, the cop, said, I have to be honest. I, I wouldn't have stopped you. You were black and you had a new Schwinn. And then McDonald said to me, it made me think. It made me put my shoes, my feet in another man's shoes. And I'm sitting there and listening to this whole story. And then he said, so uh, I became the big brother of the kid. Kid had no father and I adopted the kid. And when the kid got out of jail, he became a cop. I, I lost it. That was, so that comes to mind. I've, I've lost it a few other times, hearing stories of the loss of a child or tragedies, Holocaust stories, stories of people's inhumanity to people. But that jumps to mind. How did you deal with it after the show when you came home? That I normally don't take a show home with me. How I you manage to do I don't that? think about a show once it's over. You just say yourself, <laughs> stop it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, first, I'm a big a fan of sports. So when I was on, there was always a sporting event going on that I had to know the final score of. So I would want to get home to know scores and check the radio. And But that show I, I thought a lot about. I thought about, I've always been against uh, prejudice. Never understood it. Um, I, I've interviewed the great civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King. I never understood, ever. I don't know that I was particularly raised that way, maybe I was. I've never understood why the color of someone's skin would mean anything at all. The waste of time and effort, the idiocy of uh, intolerance, uh, prejudice to means prejudge, is insane. It's insane to prejudge something you haven't experienced and to to judge someone who by birth was either uh, Christian or Muslim or black or white or Indian or, or so I never understood it. So that story hit home for me. I was involved and so I marched uh, in marches and I, I helped. Uh, when I first came to Miami to break in the radio, I was 20, almost 23 years old. And I stepped off the train. I was going to go live with my uncle and look for work. And uh, there was two water fountains. And one said white and one said colored. And I drank out of the colored fountain. And then I got on the bus and I sat in the back of the bus. Blacks were supposed to sit in the back. Bus driver asked me to move forward. I wouldn't move forward. Because it just, and all my life, while I, in every interview I've ever done, I've never taken a stand. I always except on prejudice. If someone, if, if I had like a Ku Klux Klan member, which I've had on David Dukes or George Wallace when he was <laughs> governor of Alabama, I, I challenged him. So then crazy. you would just, uh, the silent voice, let's speak loud? Yeah. Was there a silent voice in your head when um, you were conducting those interviews? No. No? It was all reacting. I'm very much uh, a person of the moment. I uh, I like moments. I go to moments, and I try not to prethink things. So I'm a reactor, and uh, I I'm a very much probably uh, the reason I've had a lot of relationships in my life was because uh, of uh, that 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 instant reaction to something and uh, instant gratification. Uh, I don't have any regrets over it though. I really don't. I had some great kids. Uh, I've been very lucky. A lot of luck is involved in all this. What can I tell you, Andrea? Here we are, you and I in a hotel room. Oh, what the hell. <laughs>
<laughs> Life's little surprises. <laughs> when we look back, 54 years in journalism, 25 years sitting in the window of the world, watching the history, asking questions. So just by listening, you've learned a lot. So what is your lesson to be learned from what you've seen about humanity? Very good, Andrea. You're very good. <laughs> you are very good. Um, first, when I was doing it, I never thought I was either changing the world. I, didn't, I never sat on television and said, boy, this, except for Rabin and Arafat and King Hussein, that I knew that was. I never sat and said, boy, what I'm doing is really important or that people admire me, or I'm seen around the world. I never pictured the audience. I just did what I did, loved doing it. So I don't know, I don't know how to answer it. I don't, I just, but what I've learned is, uh, to quote Bertrand Russell, the mathematician and Nobel Prize winner, the only, he was at a dinner, and someone said, Professor Russell, what do you know? What do you know? And he said, the only thing I know is that I don't know. And that's so true. I don't know. And if I had a motto, it would be that uh, I never learned anything when I was talking. It's worth to listen. Yeah. Listening is as important as questioning. Mr. King, you said that you have to pinch yourself each day that this is happening to you. So, True. And now I use the I word. I must admit, I had to pinch myself today that you will sit on my show and we can conduct an interview. Thank you very much for being my guest. It's been my privilege. And one of my dreams today came true. Thank you very much. I'm money. You keep it up, more dreams will come true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. That was terrific. Dámy a páni, našim dnešným hostom v relácii Portrait bol Larry King. It's worse. <laughs>